Cool. So, uh, welcome, everybody. I actually thought I was here as a panelist, not as a moderator, but I can. I think we can do. Just <laughs> go with the flow. Uh, so, yeah. so um, just a little bit about me. So, so my background is actually physics. Um, I did a PhD in physics, and then was off in the U.S. doing research at Harvard until about uh, six months ago. So, you might wonder why I'm sitting up here, and the reason is um, inside academia, there's this huge problem. There's tons and tons of PhD students and not very many professorial jobs, and the funding is getting squeezed. And so more and more uh, academics are looking to transition into interesting jobs outside of uh, the conventional like academic route. And in Silicon Valley, they have programs that actually help these PhD students, people who've got you know, PhDs in physics, computer science, maths, become data scientists. So, because these guys obviously have a lot of the core quantitative skills that they need to be a good data scientist, but maybe they don't have the commercial veneer. So about a year and a half ago, um, I, with, with two other co-founders, uh, Angie and Daniel, set up a program, um, the ASI Fellowship, to help people um, transition into data science. So we've run uh, three fellowships now, and there are about 50 um, data scientists working at you know, some of the most interesting companies in London, uh, some big, like places like Lloyd's and, uh, and EasyJet, and some like startups like SwiftKey, and then some tiny startups that you won't have heard of, but are doing very exciting, innovative things. And so we've been able to get a bit of an average over, you know, a lot of um, people had to see, get to see like one, one route, their route into becoming a data scientist. But we've seen a bit of an average over these people. So hopefully, um, in seeing how you know, it is one particular background, but in seeing how lots and lots of people have transitioned, uh, we can give um, small bits of advice that can be helpful, and, uh, how, and seeing how people can really go into this like becoming a very effective data scientist. Great. Um, I'm Mike. I've been consulting in this space, uh, actually in the data and analytics space, for about 15 years. Um, I'm an engineer by trade um, with organizations like Accenture and so forth, but covered a range of industries from uh, mining, uh, online travel. Um, it's amazing what you can do with data in the diamond business, by the way. And uh, more recently, spending my time at Just Giving. So the last four, four or five years, I've been at Just Giving, using data science to make every one of you a bit more generous. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say, actually, it's working. In the presentation that I'll be sharing later, I'll be going into a bit more detail about how you build data science teams. And we've managed to build a team of 10 people that um, in year one release of the data-specific product, it had 25 million donations come through it. Um, so some really, really exciting stuff. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think one of the questions we were asked as we were preparing for this panel is, um, what, what, what does a data scientist do, or what does that term mean for you as an individual? And for me, um, I actually really, really like the term data scientist. I think it's one of those job titles that, if taken seriously, accurately describes what that individual should do. So data, it's not discriminating in terms of the type of data. It's, uh, it's not saying it's structured or unstructured. It's all types of data from numerics through to pictures through to sound and a whole bunch of things that we've seen, text and so forth. So I really like that part of it. It's the raw material that we use to generate value. Um, and the science bit. The science bit is probably the most exciting bit for me. Um, it also doesn't discriminate and say it has to be specifically in a numeric field. We, our data scientists have, um, and we ensure that they get an understanding of behavioral economics, um, the way we make decisions as human beings, because once you get an understanding of that, you can put an equation next to it. Imagine putting an equation next to how we make decisions and what you can do with that when you can move certain metrics around that. It gets very, very exciting. Um, and more specifically on the science bit, which a lot of people who are data scientists miss, is that science is a bit slow. So it doesn't happen overnight. There's a bit of time involved in that. And there are two aspects of that. There's, the, of course, the scientific method, but there's observation and there's experimentation. When people talk about data scientists, they kind of miss that whole experiment experimental part of things. And uh, you know, there's a lot of lean sort of uh, analytics approaches that you can take to that. Um, and as a result of that definition, we've coined another one, which is a data science engineer, um, because an engineer makes stuff. And so we have a very clear distinction between a data scientist who is fantastic at analyzing some of the statistics that you've seen here, um, you know, things like natural language processing and so forth. But when it comes to trying to build a product, enterprise-grade coding, 
it's very rare to find an individual who has all of those skills in one place. So we find data science engineers who can speak a little bit of that mathematical language, but actually make stuff happen. And I'll be going into that in a bit more detail later on. Yeah. OK, uh, my name's Greg. I'm going to stand up because I've been sitting down all day. Um, I uh, head up the, the data science efforts uh, at a startup called Stylect. Um, we have a, an app um, that basically enables women to find their perfect shoes with a kind of hot or not-like interface where you swipe left. If you don't like what you see, swipe right if you do. We've had about a million downloads. Um, we're in about 12 languages. Um, we have a growing user base in, in Europe and the US. Um, and, and I, I kind of head up everything from the, from the data engineering and the tracking side of things to getting that into our, into our data warehouse and then doing all the analytics and then um, eventually going out to, to making recommendations. And we, we serve about, uh, on the order of about 2.3 million recommendations every day. Um, so um, just to give a bit of credence maybe to what I'm saying, so you can maybe rely on, on me a tiny bit, um, just a whistle top through my background. Um, I, did, I did my undergrad um, uh, in London, um, specializing in a lot of computational methods. Um, I used a lot of Bayesian methods um, actually to uh, predict uh, the existence of an extra, uh, extrasolar planet, um, which was then verified. Uh, I did my PhD up in the Cavendish um, on lots of computational predictive work, um, and uh, Springer published my book. Um, it was when I was at MIT as a postdoc that I realized that academia was not the place for me. Um, and then, I'm, so I'm actually a byproduct of the, the ASI um, fellowship program that Mark runs. Um, and then that allowed me to transition um, into, into a data science role um, where I'm now uh, working with Stylect. So when uh, Mark, Mike, myself, and Valentina were, were discussing um, you know, what our thoughts were for, for what a data scientist is, um, there are largely two uh, broad um, ideas that, that come to mind for me. And without even getting into the whole argument of, of data scientist, data engineer, data architect, information architect, etc., cetera, um, there is aspect one, which is kind of the, uh, the, the type of data scientist who really wants to get the insight and analytics um, that, is, that is really driving the business and how you can monitor those KPIs and get your analysis. This is also um, combined with uh, the type of person who is giving you that enterprise-grade coding, um, but is also maybe starting to get interested in things like um, machine learning and how this can actually help um, the business product that, that they're trying to deliver. And so it's this, it's this kind of um, uh, broad idea that, that you have these two um, competing um, positions and where do we think the advantages lie? So in my head, um, when you have, and so the, the, uh, the graph on the, the figure on the right is, is what um, uh, IBM um, actually defined as what they think a data scientist is. And the way I look at this is, OK, that's great. You've got some business domain knowledge. This might be, say, um, someone from a, a BI group, an analyst. And they come up, and they get some great analytics. And, and they get some insight. But to me, this is a very linear process. And basically, it goes through to the insight at the end. And then there's some ideas about how you can implement this. And so this sounds very much like, for example, uh, McKinsey, who are a huge consultancy firm, have recently um, got a, a kind of startup within their company where, where they have a lot of data scientists. But at the end of the day, they produce a lot of reports and then, and then leave you to it. However, what then happens is, is that you might have your, your wonderful data scientists um, on the left-hand side here, where, and their typical tools might be, might be Python or Scikit-learn, or, or maybe R to do some stats. They get some great models together, and then, and then they think, oh, OK, uh, I don't really know what I can do with these. But your, your kind of developers, your deployment engineers on the other side are thinking, OK, what, what exactly do I do with this? How do I take this? How am I you know, going to implement this in, 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 in my role? Um, I've actually stolen this slide from, from a really interesting talk I saw um, from a data scientist at Dato, um, who were formerly Graph Lab. Um, that, that's where I first, first heard about them. Um, uh, and their, their initial solution um, was actually something um, very similar to what we saw um, from a talk earlier on, talking about APIs allowing you to connect um, between your different teams um, and to, to allow you to work in more of an agile framework. However, what I, what I personally really um, agree with is taking this type of data scientist who really knows 
about, um, about the coding, about the data warehousing, about, about the database management, um, who is also interested in the predictive side uh, of what you're working on, the analytics, the machine learning, to basically be able to deploy um, this enterprise-grade uh, enterprise level code Make sure that a data pipeline is in place or you're monitoring exactly what it is you need um, to, uh, to enable you to see exactly how that performs and then allow you to feed that back in to what you're working on. And so you've gone from this idea of a, of a, of a, of a business insights analytics kind of linear process to this, this continuous cycle and this continuous feedback loop. Um, and in my mind, the best kind of data scientist that you're, that you're looking for is a one who is um, basically a master um, of this, this cycle. Uh, and, th I mean th and this is um, also from, from personal experience, this is how we address um, uh, the data science needs at Stylect. And this is what, what we basically aspire to. We want to be the master of that, of that cycle um, and have that um, within an agile um, methodology. Now, um, Something that, I'm going to keep this one here for a minute. Something that, something that um, I see at every single um, kind of data science conference or whenever you see people talking about this um, is you ask 10 different data scientists what you think the 10 best tools are um, for your particular job and you'll get 100 different answers. And at this conference, we've seen it just like you will do at every single other data science conference, which is you'll get a huge slide that's plastered full of tools, and you get completely overwhelmed, and there are so many names that people know, and you haven't heard of those names, and you think, oh, I should be going and looking at those names because I haven't heard of that. And uh, something that, that is always niggling in the back of my mind is that it, it seems to be a habit amongst um, people in the data industry that they want to keep looking for the newest tool because they think that as long as they look for that newest thing, they're going to find their panacea and their cure-all, and they're, and they're going to find the thing that's going to absolutely solve all of their problems. And, and in my mind, this is like looking for um, you know, a great pen, a great fountain pen that, that is really comfortable and allows you to write hundreds and thousands of words when you're trying to write the next best-selling novel. And, and the point is that you have to step back and think, oh, actually, it's not, it's not the tool that you should be looking for. It's the... Um, it's the uh, uh, it's the idea, it's about constructing exactly what it is you need. So there we go, this slide. And something, uh, a great pearl of wisdom that, uh, that I heard from, from one of the mentors of the ASI fellowship um, that, that, that I was involved in um, was that you, you really shouldn't be focusing on tools because you know, every six months these, these tools are going to be different. There's going to be something new and, and like um, someone mentioned in, in, a, in a question earlier on is, you know, having to constantly change these tools are going to be expensive and so you really don't want to get into this vicious cycle of, of changing and upgrading and trying to be, you know, just, just behind the curve or even trying to predict what's going to be beyond that, that other curve. Um, so Greg, actually, can I ask a question? So yes. How do you balance the possibility of you know, these tools are more, new tools are more yeah. powerful. Yeah. So how do you think you trade those two things off? So what, what we try and do um, uh, at Stylect is, is make sure that, and that's actually a very good point, um, something that, I was, uh, that we're constantly thinking about, which is you want to be um, with the providers that you know will not necessarily be getting the latest thing that's coming from um, Apache or from, or from some other huge provider, but that actually will be maintaining their existing um, offerings, but then also making um, improvements. And so that's actually what you find with a lot of um, cloud-based providers. So I'm going to do my, um, my own version of this, and I'm going to put some, some tools up. But this is not, this is not to, to be a, the, these are the tools you should use. This is a, um, what, what we use at Stylect, for example. And so um, the, uh, the one in the middle um, is, uh, is the Google Cloud Platform. And so we use this because uh, we're a startup. We don't have um, you know, commodity hardware, and one wouldn't have the space to put it in. We, we work in a co-working space around the corner at WeWork. Um, and, and so to address Mark's question is basically what Google do with their cloud platform is they are you know, continually upgrading and maintaining, giving you um, scale at the size of the internet, which is, which is another thing that we've, we've heard today. But really, it's not the tools to be focusing on. It's the concept of you want to get someone who's going to provide you the maintenance and the upgrades um, 
yes at a fee, but it's better that that fee and that cost is going to be a lot better than continually switching providers um, and having to train up um, all your existing staff on these new principles. And you want something whereby you can basically contain your entire uh, data lake, data warehouse, um, your entire data pipeline um, in something that makes sense for your business. So if you're a huge multinational corporate, then you've probably got access to some commodity hardware somewhere and probably some people who've got the expertise. When it comes to a startup, you want to put your stuff in the cloud because you don't have access to all of that. Um, and that's, that's where you want to be thinking. Everything wants to be connected up. You want to connect where you're getting the data from, what you're doing with that, how you're tracking it, how you're analyzing it, how you're then putting it back out. So for example, with Stylect, we have our app is deployed to the Google App Engine. Um, our data then comes back in. Um, and the entire cycle uh, begins again, all in one place. Something that is often not spoken about, um, at least not in the tech tracks, uh, is so at the top left, um, there's, uh, we use um, JIRA for our, our kind of um, ticketing systems. And something I think is often overlooked is that where the real value of data science comes from is the fact that you can make iterative improvements quickly, um, and you want to fail fast and fail often, and then get to where, where those advances are. You can do this and you can maintain this by having something like a ticketing system whereby everybody knows exactly what it is they have to do. And with an agile environment, you have you know, evolving requirements. Everyone has decision-making processes. But at the end of the day, you have fixed deadlines. And you must hit those. That is, that is key um, to the business. Um, and so that, that is something I think is really important for allowing you to iterate and to, and, and to improve. Um, so uh, at Stylex, we use Bitbucket, but the, the tool is irrelevant. The concept is version control, which is so important. And I probably don't need to, to mention it, but it, it doesn't get mentioned explicitly. So I, I felt like I should. Um, and, and this is just so important, even for little things like, as, as your data science teams, you will be iteratively improving. And if it turns out that on one quick improvement you deployed, you completely mess something up, that's, that, that's fine, because you can just go back to the, to the latest version you, you were working on that you knew was stable. Um, in the top right-hand corner, um, we use Python um, in, our, in our back end, in our, our data um, uh, modeling um, in Stylex um, and you know and, and various other languages for our for our for our, for our front end and then you know we have Android and iOS apps and so you have languages that are tied to those. The key concept, however, is find either what languages are um, what are the key strengths in your existing organization. What 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 are the programming languages that people know and that people are best with, um, and how can you uh, let your stack your tech stack uh, take advantage of this. Or when it comes to the plethora of data science tools um, that are available to you, they will always have wrappers in, in Java, in Python, in various other languages. And actually, they won't have wrappers for every single one. And you can narrow down a lot that way as well, because it can be very overwhelming. Um, then, of course, it's about tying it all together. So um, at the bottom in the middle, um, the penguin is Tux. And um, he, to me, represents Linux and all, all that is great about it being able to automate your entire stack. Um, and it's something that you really need to make sure that you're not just thinking about individual tools that can do one individual job. And then you know, that, that, that's it. It just outputs something, and that's it. It will always be feeding into something else. And it's all about the automation and how you, 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 uh, you, you do that. And then in the bottom right, um, this particular tool we use at Stylact is Slack um, for our messaging communication. And this is something that's absolutely vital. And again, this is the concept of you've got to be continually communicating in your teams um, and making sure that all, all the time the, the business um, uh, aspect is always a um, uh, priority. So um, kind of segueing into that, we were thinking, you know, something that isn't really discussed enough is this communication. And so on things like Slack and Bitbucket um, is where a lot of the tech discussion can go. And so if you've got particular bugs that are happening, particular versions that you think something can be improved, then you can, you can basically allow your, your, your devs um, 
your statisticians, your analysts, your data scientists to really use that, those channels. And then similarly, the data scientist, who, as it's becoming increasingly um, apparent, doesn't really have one particular um, solid role, will also need to um, communicate with your, with your biz dev people, um, your marketing, your QAs, um, on other channels as well. Can I be a bit controversial here? Yes. Actually, um, is anybody here work? Is anyone here a data scientist? At, by calls themselves a data scientist. Anyone worked with a data scientist? So what's interesting that you said here is that a data scientist will have to also communicate to marketing teams and so forth. Just hands up if anyone thinks data scientists are probably the best communicators out there. <laughs> 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 Two. So the question to you is: Is it unrealistic to expect somebody who you're talking about having a st 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 statistics, mm. uh, mathematics, machine yeah. learning, and also the ability to c to code yeah. to also be able to articulate themselves and communicate so with the likes? Exactly. Of yeah, and and that's why we kind of get close to like the whole kind of unicorn picture of like someone who has all these ridiculous amount of skills. Um, but uh, the way I often end up thinking about it is. You're never going to be like the absolute best communicator um, in the world, especially if you're if you're someone from a, from a tech background, because not that we want to generalise, but they have a certain um, kind of uh, social uh, uh, cliche surrounding them. <laughs> However, um, at the end of the day, when it comes to in a professional manner, communication is still just a skill, um, and it, and to me, it's still just the same as you know having to switch and to learn a different programming language or a slightly different um, data paradigm or something else. And I think, and as um, Mark uh, and the rest of the team at the ASI have shown, this is, this is a, a skill that can be taught. Um, and, you know, for example, when I was doing the ASI fellowship, when we all started there, I saw so many people who were, had this real um, academic mindset of, I don't talk to anyone, I just work on my own, and I also take weeks and weeks and weeks to get anything done because I want it to be perfect. Um, before I even let anyone see it, um, and I certainly don't communicate until you know a year down the line when I'm writing a paper um, in a really dense form that's difficult to to, to tease out the ideas. Um, and I saw a lot of people during my time in the fellowship being kind of brought out of this this shell. Um, so, and I personally don't think they're ever going to be perfect, but I think you can you can build. It's about it's about iterations, right? It's about. Um, but it, it, I don't think it's something that's addressed. Um, very well, and it's kind of just expected a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, that's why. I think Good answer. <laughs> um, and I think because I've taken up too much time chatting about this anyway, um, the at the end of the day, um, with all the ideas of tooling and skills that you want your data scientists to have, um, at the end of the day, it's about it's about the money. If you're in a if you're in a, a, a commercial company. Then that's 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 what it's about, right? I'm not saying that the um, the Stylek co-founder is uh, is um, is that bad, but um, yeah. Uh, but then then when it comes down to it, what what I knew is because I had very good um, communication networks with um, the people who were in um, on kind of the business side um, of Stylek, with the with the CEO, with the head of marketing, it meant that. It was, it was very um, clear to me that I had to do iterative improvements quickly, fail fast. When I, when I started at Stylect, they didn't have any recommending whatsoever. I had to design, um, uh, build, implement, deploy a recommender system. And you know the, the very first um, instance of the recommender w was built and deployed in a couple of days. And then, because before then I'd been building the data pipeline and making sure that was in place, um, that actually performed worse um, than what than the other automated approaches we already had. And that was because we had that analytics straight in place. And then two days later, again, went through that cycle and then improved the performance. And then that's successfully what we've been building on since then. And the reason the reason I'm telling you this is because the metrics we were using um, in order to to measure the performance of this were, were purely based on you know how well. Um, the company was doing what what, um, what, the, what the GMV was uh, at the end of every month based on these recommendations, and so, and I, and, and you know I have the picture of, of 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 making money here, but it's whatever the organization's um, you know key absolutely crucial drivers are that the data scientist really has to be in tune with, 
and not just be um, you know, in, in some um, academically inclined corner of the office, which is the data science team, um, working on these lovely models, which are probably amazing. But, uh, but if, unless you can see the impact that they're having and, and they're being driven by the business, I've seen so many articles being written recently that are saying, people are going to stop hiring data scientists once they realize how little value they actually bring um, to companies. And, and this, is, this is the key problem. They're hiring intelligent people who have all these wonderful skills, but they're not allowing them to contribute to the, <coughs> to the benefit of the company because they're not getting these, these key crucial drivers involved, which I think is, is an important um, part of both sides. Um, Can I make this. another point? Yep. Sorry, you may choose not to invite me to a panel again if I keep doing it. It's only with reference to your slide, and it, you, you said something else towards the end, which I'm more comfortable with, when you said it's mostly about money. Um, I think uh, data science has a part to play in much broader areas as well. Um, has anybody heard of a company called Mark 43? Um, so they basically put police activities into the cloud. It's not really about money, but with some of the recent things that have happened in the US with police shootings and so forth, um, that, that data allows people to sort of police the police's activity. Um, you've got companies doing the same in Africa for corruption. Um, you've got the Black Dog Institute. Anyone heard of that? Um, that basically is an app that you can put on your phone, and it detects um, and predicts the likelihood of you becoming depressed, you know, um, using all the data that's available in your phone mm. and who you're communicating with, mm. and the sphere of movement that you have as an individual. Mm. So whilst I think, yes, for many commercial organizations, mm. that's the bottom line, I think there is a big space for what data science could do for us as individuals oh, yeah. beyond yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, it's about having that key driver of the yeah. organization. Yeah. 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 Cool. That was my point. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right, who's next? So should we do maybe, if anyone has any questions, yeah. like At this let's stage? start the, actually, can I just do ask, so, so we found out there was about, I don't know, five or 10 data scientists here, so I'd like to know what everyone else oh, yeah. does. So, yeah. Who is a software developer? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and who is a manager of some description? Also. And so who else is, has not put their hand up? Can you guys? Marketing. Just... Marketing. <laughs> Architect, OK. Some students. <laughs> cool. All right. OK. Um, so so let's, let's have a few questions now and try and make it a bit more interactive. It shouldn't yeah. just be the panels no. asking questions. So here. Okay, okay so um, most of us here are engineers. I think we've already established that, right? And uh, you drew a really important, to me, distinction between a data scientist and a data scientist engineer, but didn't really elaborate on that very much. Would you care to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in, in my experience with the organizations that we've worked with, um, we had the people with the skill set that could delve into the data and find something useful to do with it. Um, these are the guys who typically were really strong data miners, but had a good mathematics and statistics background to them. And they were fantastic. They would, they would go into there and find the magic numbers. So you know, like in Facebook, if you connect with seven friends, it changes your engagement by, by X, you know? Um, on, on just giving, if we get you to give um, more than, if you raise, and you're raising money for charity, if you raise more than 75 pounds, you double your chances of fundraising again. You know? So these are the sort of guys who find those sort of little nuggets of information. But if you ask them to then build a product that say, as soon as a user arrives onto the site, uh, predict exactly what to serve them in terms of relevant and personal content, mm -hmm. it's a slightly different skill set. You know, so these are the guys who would have to be able to do some coding, use some of the tools that you mentioned over there, um, and move data, move data from large sets of data from one place and make it available in real time mm -hmm. using things like Spark and so forth. Mm -hmm. Slightly different who having the ability to dig through and rummage through data and find really nuggets of information. That's the distinction I've, I've, I've drawn between the two. Yeah. If I, if I could just switch to my slides, uh, I talk about this a little bit as well. Mm. Um, do you have agreement? I think broadly, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there's quite, you know, the whole thing is a, um, well, I'll just say it anyway. I'll have to skip <laughs> this bit when we come to it. So I, I see it as a spectrum. So the yeah. data science exists as this, uh, as this kind of wedge. On one hand, going from sort of visualization through analytics and then uh, into data engineering. Here we go. 
And so on, one, on, on the one side, we have the people who understand the problem, analyze the data, provide the recommendations. And on the other side, we have people who are architecting solutions, who create the infrastructure, who can really build robust production quality code and pull all of that together. Of course, the truth is these things are a spectrum and people can find their place inside this. So it's not as simple as just you know, one person does all of the infrastructure and, and one person does all of the analytics mm. because the communication is bad, to Greg's point, and you have this tendency to throw stuff over the wall yeah. in the same way that like, we now have DevOps. Like having people sitting across all parts of the spectrum seems to be helpful for an organization to make it so that um, everyone is consistently incentivized to, make the, uh, to improve everyone else's life. So the data scientist knows enough data engineering, is familiar enough with the tools to be able to speak to them, to be able to use them, uh, and the, the vice versa with the, with the data engineer. Today, this camp on the right, it's not more representative. This is very oh, difficult. Right. We need to run this session with recruiters here instead of all of us, because mm. they don't know this yet. Right. So, so it makes it very difficult. If I, you're I, will, uh, I, I, will, I wasn't going to talk about this, but <laughs> um, so ASI does a, a, a PhD to data science fellowship. And we completely agree that this is a problem, that the data engineers are not available and companies are actually even more interested in data engineers than they are in data scientists at this moment. So in uh, June and July next year, we're going to start a fellowship for experienced software developers, sort of two, three years experience, to become data engineers in a very similar program. So it's going to take you know, an eight-week boot camp, introduce you to the tools, and, and help people um, shift across into, you know, because it's probably the most exciting part, part of software development at the moment. These tools are really the, the cutting edge of, of what we're doing. And so if you're interested in that, uh, I think you can even uh, apply on our website at the moment. I, I think I completely agree. This, this, the data engineers are in shorter supply mm. than the data scientists. If, if you really abstract what data science is about and what it can do, we had people doing data, scientists, data science in the 1980s, right? So these guys were really digging into data and coming up with smart algorithms, you know, from the, the credit check reference agencies and so forth, all, all around that time. But in the data engineering space, a lot of these technologies are new. So when you get people talking about being a data engineer using, te using Hadoop for the last 15 years, I keep laughing. You know, has it been around for the public consumption during that, for that length of time? Um, and so that, that area, definitely, I absolutely agree with you, is in serious short supply. Right, so over here. I have a similar question about recruitment and the program. You were quite explicit about what a data scientist is and what a data engineer is. Mm -hmm. Is that and look at the um, job specs of, say, 10 data science jobs, you would yeah. see job specs ranging from effectively a software engineer mm. um, who might be able to count to um, a <laughs> data analyst number cruncher yeah. who yeah. might know a little bit of SQL. Um, so how do we, as data scientist professionals, help companies understand exactly what a data scientist is and what they can do for them, and if they're even ready to have one yet? Yeah. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think that's a, that's a huge problem in that <clears throat> lots of people seem to be looking for data scientists but don't necessarily know, well, one, what it is, two, what, what they should be able to do, and maybe three, if they do even need one. And I think, I, think, I don't know, would you guys agree with that statement? And I yeah, think, I think as, as the field kind of starts to, starts to mature, I think, I think what you have to realize is that maybe... Um, and, it, and it's going to be a very, this is a very, me, this is me wandering around the question because I have no idea how to answer it um, <laughs> perfectly. But, you know, I think that, you know, for example, in my own professional experience, I know what a data scientist at Stylect kind of looks like. Um, and I know all the tools that we have available and, and what we do. However, you know, I work in a co-working space and sit next to, a, to another startup and, and their di data scientist looks completely different. And so I think that's, that's when you realize that it's more about um, the company needing to know um, what it is they require more than what does the position entail. And so I think that you, you, need, to get, you need to have that paradigm shift of you're not looking for a, for a, for a job spec. Um, a company is looking, has requirements. Um, and I think, I think maybe that's how you can help companies think about what they actually need, then they're not looking for a spec, they're looking for requirements of their own company. They have to internalize that. That's how I think about that. Um, 
I would actually agree fully with, with what you said and also the articulation of the problem. I think we as data scientists also have a responsibility in that, in being able to articulate what it is we do and create the distinctions where those distinctions lie. Um, so I think we need, as a, as a cohort, need to do more of that. Um, and also educating the likes of recruiters, perhaps, so that they're also not blurring the lines too much and also um, allowing us to articulate ourselves properly and, and helping in that process. And then finally, on the company side, I think companies should be a bit more leaner. A lot of companies, it's a fad right now, they all want data scientists. Um, and then they have nothing to do when they get there. And I think there's, a, there's an approach that they, the companies can take. Uh, which I'll go through actually, I'll, I'll talk about what Just Giving did and the approach that they took eventually starting from two and ending up at 10 with a product. But there's no way we would have, if we had recruited those 10 to begin with, we wouldn't have had a product. So, I think probably this is, this is also a problem that kind of naturally solves itself as the field matures, right? Mm. Like the harm that is done now is maybe some charlatans get jobs as data scientists, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's probably quite small um, as we, as you know, as with anything, as everything matures, it will become more precisely defined. The role will uh, yeah, become that's right. clearer. That's right. This guy in the middle. Hi, thanks. Uh, really interesting discussion, and my question has been changing as you kept talking, <laughs> all three of you, so I'll ask the most recent version, I guess. Um, just picking up on some other chaps, definition of a data scientist as being an engineer who knows more stats. Um, and a statistician, uh, you know, better than a statistician at engineering and better uh, than an engineer at stats. Wouldn't the same be um, a data engineer? Wouldn't be somebody who knows more infra than a statistician, but also he knows more stats than a DevOps guy. And my question there would then be, and you just mentioned, sorry, about data scientists looking different everywhere, right? then you have, uh, then isn't that a mindset thing, data science? is just somebody who's inquisitive and he expresses the, his inquisitive mind with tools, whereas data engineering is very much, this is the skills of building and for of architecting solutions of actually like thinking about the whole picture rather than going, ooh, interesting problem, let's, let's poke at it. Mm -hmm. So how do you think the definition of, isn't it just inherently that data science is more broadly defined and data engineering is very, easy to define, these are the skills, these are the requirements, I, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think, I, think I, I agree in part that maybe you'd want a data engineer to perhaps come in and either, you know, um, spec up your existing, or if you don't have any real, real data engineering to like spec something up and you know that they have experience of doing this, that and the other and they can build you a data lake and everything else. Um, <laughs> But I think, I think at the end of the day, and, and the solutions might be clearer to define, like you said, I think with a data scientist, I think the problem is that the solutions that you want them to get to will be harder to define, but that is, that is still a responsibility from both, both the data scientist and whoever it is that, that's employing them, because at the end of the day, so for example, um, uh, from, from my professional experience, Stylact, we're, um, we're VC funded um, and we have to, you know, present um, reports to our investors to basically be like, this is, this is what we're doing with the funding that you've given us. And so, and so I, have to, I have to, you know, um, make these reports. And so as a data scientist, I still have to have those key, um, you know, not like targets, for example, but I, I have done something, I have generated some solution. So I think it still has to be defined, but it's, it's certainly more difficult to do. And I'm not saying it's easy, um, but I think, I think it is the responsibility of, of the data scientists and the people that are hiring them to, to work towards what that solution could be. Yeah, so I was yeah. 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 And then we move, as we move along, we will take some mm -hmm. more questions, but yeah. let's make sure that we go through the slides. Yeah. I've seen the presentations and they're already interesting. <laughs> Cool. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, I I was sort of um, asked to speak about the training of data scientists, and actually, you know, we've we've um, kind of touched on many of the things I'm going to talk about. So maybe we'll move a bit faster. So just briefly, the ASI does a few things. We do this fellowship, we do training, and we do consulting. And for anyone who is interested in uh, hiring fellows from the program, there's going to be one in January and February, and we'd love to talk to you.
We've worked with lots of very interesting companies through this process, and so we've got a nice view across what different companies call uh, data scientists, how they're using them. And you know, to tell you the truth, mentioning no specific names, the, uh, what they show in their marketing materials is not what we see internal to these companies. You know, it's, uh, a lot of what's talked about is, um, is perhaps the, uh, the year or two's dreams rather than the, the current reality. Uh, so I've kind of gone through this. We know we see these things as a spectrum uh, that people can find their place on. Obviously, there's always the place for like the, the pure uh, data scientist right at one end. But you can have someone who sits more in the middle, has this, this hybrid skill set, and those people we see are very, very useful as well. Why, why is the data scientist old with glasses? <laughs> 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 that, 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 hey. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be... <laughs> So when I was um, thinking about what to talk about, uh, you know, kind of in this, in this manner of like companies want a data scientist, but don't really know what it is. And I think there's a nice analogy here with like, if someone say, just, just come to you and say, get me a chef, you, you wouldn't even know where to start. Like that doesn't have a unique meaning. Mm -hmm. To some people that's like, you know, some guy at the local greasy spoon who's gonna be able to fry some bacon and heat up some beans. And right at the other end, there's someone who's like creating recipes, like pushing the field forward, uh, leading from the, from the front at a kind of Michelin star restaurant. And for data science, it's, it's the same. You know, this is our attempt at ASI. So actually, I should say we have the fellowship, we have this consulting arm, so we do have our own set of, um, you know, we have a team of about five data scientists now at ASI. And this is kind of what we've put together as, as a, a taxonomy of data science to try and separate out these roles so companies can start to think about the level that they need someone to come in at. So um, I got kind of confused myself because I skipped over the data science and data engineering. So for all of this talk, I'm going to be referring to data science now. Data engineering is very important, but it's not what I'm going to be talking about here. So you know, in, in, in analogy with, these, with the chefs, at the bottom level, we've got someone who can, who can take data, who can pull it in, who can clean it up who can visualize it, maybe get you some averages, this kind of thing. But broadly speaking, is, is more of an analyst. And then as we progress up, you know, it, it, it kind of people grow in terms of what they're capable of, how um, insightful they can be, how novel they can be, and how much experience they have over the domain of data science. And right at the top, you have something like your chief data officer, where actually even you have a whole new set of skills. So you need this broad experience of, of like data science, but you also need this management experience. And it's really for you internally as, as a kind of company to decide um, what particular brand of uh, data scientist you need um, on this spectrum, because obviously the cost goes up as you go up this list. So then we tried to put together some skills that we thought really represented what um, data scientists uh, like have the, the kind of skills that you'd like to see in your in your dream data scientist and I'm going to kind of um, go through them in a particular order and somebody mentioned this uh, earlier I forget who but they were talking about um, how probably the most like fundamental core aspect of data science isn't even like a technology or a programming language or even a mathematical ability it's really just curiosity like do like, problems intrigue you or not? Do you want to find out the answer or not? Because um, it's really onerous to try and force yourself to do something, like to sit down with this enormous data set where you don't really know that there's right answers and, and just plow through it because you're paid to do it. it you know, people are much, much more successful when they're curiosity driven. They actually want to find out the answer. Can I just Go sort of re-emphasize yeah. that? I think that's fundamental to uh, any data scientist. From a management perspective, because some people put their hands up as, as, as we're managing people, it is also one of the most difficult to handle um, because you, you have time pressures, you have things you have to deliver. And data scientists, the true ones, do get a little distracted sometimes. Though. And so I, I built an algorithm that predicted what mood my wife was instead of, <laughs> <laughs> what, what instead of doing my work. What was the data that went into that? <laughs> I, I'll, I'm going to patent that, actually. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so then, so then this is kind of the foundation. After that, we've got like a set of core skills that you know, um, are fairly uh, prevalent across the board, but um, uh, you know, are kind of necessary just to, to be able to start thinking about the data. So numeracy, some kind of coding ability, and some kind of communication ability. Now, I'm, I'm like, Greg, I, I, I do think that these are, you know, communication is a skill that can be taught, at least to an extent. But you kind of get this picture where we're sort of building up foundations. We have like personality foundations, and then these are, these are like broadly developed over a long period of time in your career. And then we start to get to the more advanced skills. So maybe a data scientist doesn't need all of these things, but um, they probably need some familiarity with each individual one. Uh, so, so obviously, things like machine learning are, um, I mean, maybe uh, just from our experience at ASI, so you saw all the, all the lists of companies. How many of those like, actually need machine learning right now to answer their biggest data science problems? Probably like one, maybe two. It's really surprising how um, these other skills, these, these four things that I've talked about previously, for most organizations at the moment, those four would suffice to solve probably 90% of the problems we see. Of course, you can take your insights and make a very smart predictive model. Of course, you can uh, overfit data and pretend to your management that you've done something yeah. incredibly clever. <laughs> but the, the truth is that um, with a kind of basic numeracy and basic coding ability, uh, you can get a very, very long way. But if you want to be developing new if you want to be at the cutting edge, if you want to be developing new solutions, if you want to be competing with people like Google uh, and Facebook and these kind of guys, then these are really fairly uh, fundamental skills. And then finally, the last thing that um, is obviously important is, is some kind of business awareness, some kind of commercial awareness, uh, getting things done to timetables, valuing, like having this ability, uh, this really difficult balance between curiosity and delivery. So you need to to be curious enough to, to explore the data, to understand what's going on, but then uh, determined enough to deliver to timetables and this kind of thing. And so, you know, we can sort of look at this as some kind of pyramid, um, that we have a foundation of curiosity, then these kind of like core skills to a person, and then these more advanced skills and finally experience. And I guess the usefulness of this is that we can start to uh, think about where in internally and externally to organizations, we can find those skills. So certainly Chunkston, and I'll talk about this a bit further in a minute, are inside sort of business development, software intelligence, quant. Externally, of course, the ASI has, uh, has really great people, but also there are recruiters, master's programs, Silicon Milk Roundabout, all these kind of areas. That may be helpful just to get started to start talking to some people about what, they, what skills they have and figure out how well they match to what your company needs. <laughs> so we have, we, yeah, practical, so. uh, we do three courses a year. Each course has about 15 to 20 mm -hmm. uh, like people on it, fellows, um, so about 60 a year. Uh, we try to keep it small because, you know, we um, really like working with the very, you know, smartest and most charming people <laughs> uh, like Greg here. And so. I felt left out. No. So we, uh, as, a, as a kind of short tagline, we say it's PhDs to data scientists, but the truth is we always have people with a variety of backgrounds on there. Uh, it's just a harder story to explain um, in, a, in an event. So, you know, obviously the dream is we just get all of these skills immediately and we just hire that person and they, they change our company forever. It's kind of hard to do in real life. And um, so how, how should we think about this in a more practical sense? Well, I, uh, my idea, and I, I think there are a variety of others, is, um, is to start with looking for people with this kind of core level and then train them in these more advanced skills. So here's the sort of profile on this pyramid of, a, of an ASI fellow. You know, they're obviously curious. They've been involved in academia. They've been trying to solve very hard problems, basically for the sake of solving very hard problems. And uh, they you know, have some experience in... They're, gonna, they're coming from a maths, physics, computer science background, so they're numerate, they can code. And then we try and move them up into this like statistics, machine learning, 
data engineering part of the pyramid um, so that when they go into organizations, they can, can bring those skills with them. Of course, that's not the only place. So, so in, in business intelligence, perhaps, you have more of, uh, of these kind of skills. So maybe um, some like, really good ability to communicate, uh, numerate already, and with business experience and curiosity, but perhaps not the same uh, level of coding or, or these more advanced skills. And then, you know, software development as well teaches you a range of these things. Maybe not so great on the communication, that might be a stereotype, but uh, also with business experience, have learned to deliver on time, deliver pro production quality code, these kind of things. And so for me, um, there, are, there are two real messages. One is to sort of figure out what kind of level in this taxonomy that would really suit your organization the best. And then you've got to find the people to try and fulfill that role. And perhaps thinking in terms of this pyramid and then looking externally to, uh, to train people in the skills, to develop them internally, is, um, is a good way of really finding, finding and building effective data scientists. And then, just <laughs> I'm a bit embarrassed about how many pitches are in here, but one last pitch uh, <laughs> is that we're working with UCL to do some training around these things as well. So they're helping us out with the fellowship and, and externally. Um, so, yeah, I guess since I'm moderating, does anyone have any questions for the speaker? <laughs> Hi, um, I guess I consider myself a bit of a data scientist, and I have, in the last year, helped set up two different data science teams. In that time, I've screened over 150 different CVs, and I think probably six of them are actual data scientists. So I was just wondering, do you guys have any golden questions or sort of go-to things you use to filter people on? I know I have my, my own set. I was just wondering if you have any sort of better ones, perhaps. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually in a funny position. So um, ASI, you know, we get about 150 applicants for our 15 places these days. So we have to do a lot of this. The problem is we really like the idea of adding value. And if we just test people on whether they know data science and machine learning right now, then you know, they'll go on to get jobs, that's great, but uh, we're not really adding anything. The kind of foundational mission was to take you know, physicists and make them data scientists. And so we have our range of questions, but they're perhaps not so appropriate <coughs> to just like screening for existing data science skills. Oh, sure, sorry, I, I guess we're we are talking about two slightly different environments, of course. I'm, exactly. I'm referring more to the interview environment. So I think these guys are going to be, be more useful for I'd you. also be quite interested in... in the, so we're, we're looking at... In my current company, we're looking at setting up a graduate scheme for exactly this sort of thing where we... I'm, I work for a consulting company, so you know, we have to get people into it quite quickly, but yeah. I'd also be quite interested to get your perspective on that side as well as to how you might judge someone who maybe isn't ready to be a data scientist, isn't already a data scientist, but has the skill set to quickly become one. Yeah. And how you make that discrimination. Uh, do, you just, do you just have an algorithm? <laughs> Repeat the question. In a way, the short version for the... Okay, so, so if, you're, if you're looking for uh, non-data scientists who you think have potential, um, who would you choose? Uh, so we are in the fortunate position that, um, you know, uh, most of the people who apply to our program have, like, a PhD in math, physics, or computer science. So we can be fairly sure that mm, okay, back doesn't work. Uh, that these kind of bottom level skills, the numeracy, the curiosity, um, these kind of things are, uh, are, are available. Then actually, um, what we mainly concern ourselves with is the communication ability. Uh, so for us, the technical skills are not so, so much in question. It's really um, how are they going to work in a team? How do they communicate? Can they explain complicated things effectively? So our interview process is much, much more skewed to, uh, to that side of things than to the, uh, to the technical side. So we get people to um, explain something very complicated from their PhD to as if we were complete laymen and had no idea. And that's really, we've found to be a very good indicator of um, you know, this ability to, to, to take complicated information, present it in a way that the, uh, the important lessons are obvious to people, which 
obviously translates very directly into data science. We, um, I think it's a fantastic question, actually, and you've really got me thinking. There's, there's one theme that I've seen across those that we've, that we've hired and have been successful, because we've had some misses. Um, and the key theme is, what do they do in their spare time? Because um, I actually think, with data science, it's one of those things, there's a bit of an, an art to it, if you like. So it's quite hard for it to end. Um, and for every single one of the guys on our team, they live and breathe this stuff. Um, and so they're always doing something interesting. Some of them are closet gamblers. Um, and so <laughs> always coming up with algorithms for the next match that's taking place here and there and gambling on strange things like the weather. Um, but they literally, day and night, these guys are always thinking about the next thing that they can do with a piece of data that just happens to be around. They live and breathe this stuff. And it's great from a working environment because they don't leave at 5 the, they're, they're there the whole, they just live and breathe this stuff. So that's one theme I've seen, definitely. And I think also just quickly adding on that to a topic of what they do outside. So for example, you know, simple things like GitHub and, and Kaggle and maybe what people have done. Uh, something I found useful is just taking a, a data set that I know I have a lot of, a, a lot of um, characteristics that I know about, adding in artificial mess and just saying to someone, just go and see what you can find. Um, I don't care what method you use or how you do it, just see what you can get. And uh, sometimes I've been surprised by what people have got, and actually that's, that's sometimes where you see the most interesting candidate. I think we've got to move on to the next yeah. presentation. Uh, so OK, um, great. So I'm, I've been um, basically going to be sharing a little bit about how to create data science teams, really going through the process that we went through at Just Giving. Um, and uh, these are the four key themes. I, mean, I could literally stop at this slide, but I'll share a few more <laughs> stories around that. But uh, the, the, there are a lot more behind this, by the way, but these are the four that I picked. First one is the analytical maturity of the organization. I mean, I've, I consult as well. So I've come across organizations that say, we need a data scientist, and they're not capturing any data. You know, and they've, they've got all of this activity, but they're not, they haven't got any data. So how analytically or data mature are they? I think we saw... I can't remember who it was who spoke earlier and talked about the data maturity spectrum or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So that was one of the talks we saw this afternoon. Where is that organization with regards to that? Some of them are capturing certain things, but the questions that they weren't answering are in a completely different excuse me, place. Uh, the second bit is the problem statement. Um, it could be capturing a lot of data, storing it for potential value in the future. What is it you actually want these guys to do? So how clearly articulated is that problem statement? And I'll take you through that. Because actually, there's a big part that data science itself can play in determining what that problem statement should be. Um, and then obviously, the other two with the distinction that I've drawn is that we start the science, start the, the investigation, and then also the engineering, build the product. The overarching theme around that that I'm going to stick with is this whole thing about staying lean and focusing on value. I know these are, these are buzzwords that a lot of people are using now. But it really does work. There is no point in recruiting, at least we found in our experience, in recruiting that team of 20 data scientists when you haven't even finished the first two of those bubbles. Because they're just going to sit around there. And, you know, there's, so there's, there's a sequence in which these things can be done. Also, if you don't have the budget to hire those 20 in one go, following this sequential approach seems to work. Because by doing one of these bubbles, you sort of gain credence to be able to do the next thing and also can easily buy budget because you've demonstrated value straight away and can go on to the next one. And that's essentially the route that we've chosen. So that's what I'll tell you about in Just Giving. We've had half the adult population in the UK use our platform. So I'm going to just test it here. Has anybody here used Just Giving before? Ah, brilliant. That works. OK, great. So I don't have to say too much about it. But this is what our data scientists have built. We call it the Give Graph. This is a snapshot of real data. Um, this is a snapshot of people connected to causes that they care about. Um, the donation activity, the comments that they're making, the amounts that they're giving, new causes coming up, doing things in different places. With this Griff graph, you can find out if somebody is interested in animals, I think we have, and if they're interested specifically in cats uh, that, have, that need rehousing and only have one leg. You know? And if that's the sort of thing that they're so passionate about, this Give graph gives us the answer to that. And it's this that we needed to productize, and it's this that, I said earlier, in year one has brought in um, over 20 million in terms of donations, and we'll continue to do that. It wasn't an easy project, and we had to go through that sequential approach because we needed buy-in. Imagine having the task of saying, in the charity industry, where would you use data science? 
you know, and, and my passion is to do something good with this space, especially when you realize how you can manipulate people, it's important to be ethical. And so, um, a little bit about us as an organization, as I said, these slides are a bit outdated, those numbers have moved up. So about 25 million users, 165 countries, we've raised over 3 billion in terms of donations, that's in dollars, um, in a range of currencies. At the moment, we're raising more than a million pounds a day. The UK is a pretty generous place, guys, although not as generous as the US, but I think platforms like this are really changing things. So um, it's quite exciting. And not many people know that about just giving. You've probably interacted with it less frequently than you have with other platforms, but we're hoping to change that. Um, and this is typically what you come to just giving for. And you can see how much data there is. So this is somebody fundraising for a cause that they care about. Typically some sort of life, life event has taken place. They put their story there, they pick a charity, the charity describes its cause. And you get people to come and donate and people come and leave a comment and leave an amount. Every single one of these is a data point. You can imagine what you can pull out when you read the story or when a machine reads the story. Imagine what you pull out when you see a donation and the comment left next to a donation. And this is where, when I talked about earlier about a data scientist, the science part, exploring other parts of science become really key. Because behavioral economics plays such a big role in how you can inspire or encourage people to donate. If you can see what happens on the donation side, there's five pounds, five pounds, then 10 pounds. We tend to encourage fundraisers to to get their family to donate first because their family give large amounts. If someone has put a 50 pound donation on there, what are the chances of you being excited to come and put a five pound donation? Um, so even just that, the nudge theories that take place there, just putting, if you just rank those by donation amount, the next 18 donations are on average equal to the same donation that's there. You have some cheap people, fortunately analytics can tell us that, who come on and keep refreshing until they can see somebody else put that five pound in there. <laughs> I'm comfortable now. Okay. <laughs> I can do that. But that's what, that's what data gives us. It gives us a lot of information. I was joking there, by the way, too, that they're not cheap people. It's just, you know, different circumstances. Um, but uh, um, the key thing is at that stage, at the beginning when we started addressing this, we had to check the analytical maturity of the organization, which meant there was a lot more data that we needed to capture. We're a web platform. We needed to capture what every single person was doing. You know, all the clicks, the things that they were seeing, what they were scrolling, rather than just capturing the transactions. So we had to go beyond that. And we were only a team of two. At that point, there was no need to go any further. We also needed to try and articulate the problem statement. Um, this is our, our mission, um, and we're quite passionate about ensuring that every cause gets the funding that it requires. But here's where predictive analytics plays a part. So those two data scientists spend their time focusing on what's the most valuable thing they can give the organization at that stage. And so they dug through the numbers. These are the guys who are just digging through all of that transactional data. And they found two really interesting things. Um, they found a really good correlation between visits, people who come to visit, user engagement potentially, frequency of visits, and the amount of donations that you got. And they also saw that you could pretty much predict a journey that somebody was going to do based on a whole bunch of variables. Some of those I, I will share, some I will. But even things like you can, depending on what newspaper a person reads, predicts the sort of journey that they're gonna take on the site. You know, um, where, they where they live, their address, um, who their friends are. Really, really interesting behaviors that you can see and therefore predict once you had all that information about Sorry. the individual. Which is the most generous newspaper and which is the least <laughs> generous? Yeah, that'd be telling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there are some relationships there actually, you know. And some newspapers have more people who cycle, for example, for charity. Um, and then others would do things like host dinners and things like that. So not only could you predict that, you could also predict what that person was likely to do. Mm -hmm. This was with two, two data scientists, and it's at the beginning of the stage. And I think when you do that and you present that back to your investors, you're in a really good position for them to say, we've got to do some more stuff in this space. And so very quickly, we were in a position to articulate our problem statement. What we wanted to do was build a product that gets users to visit far more frequently, um, uh, discover causes that they could give to, so things that they could potentially be interested in, and um, give way more in a 12-month period, you know, so using all of the data that we've got. So that's our problem statement. Became very, very clear. We know exactly what we're focusing on. This doesn't say anything about producing reports, right? This is building a product, so it's very, very explicit. And so that bought us, just that initial sort of research that I talked about and the things that we found in the data, bought us the resource to be able to get three more individuals. Right? 
And so with three more individuals still sticking on the data science space, because what we wanted were people who were able to develop algorithms from the data that we had, not necessarily build the product just yet, because we needed to know exactly what this product would look like at first. Um, and so we tried a few things. Let's build a recommendation engine so that when people come, they can help them discover new content. Right? So because X people like you have given to this, let's show you this. What's really interesting, the recommendation engine was absolutely fantastic at predicting what sort of events you might be interested in. Cycling, running, parachute jumping, hosting dinners, wacky stuff like wearing a gimp suit to work for a week. <laughs> People did that, by the way. Um, <laughs> sitting in a bathtub full of beans, so things, things, things like that. Um, it could predict all of that, but it was hopeless at predicting what cause you cared about. You see, what we found is when you're talking about things that you're passionate about, you can't use a collaborative filter. Lookalikes don't work. So the way Amazon would say that most people who buy this item, uh, most people who buy DVD players will go and buy an RF cable. Do you need RF cables? Anymore? No, Scott Lead, let's just say. Um, uh, I'm showing my age. Yeah. <laughs> and, and uses TVDs. <laughs> no one uses that either. Amazon um, Prime Video. <laughs> um, but you could use a collaborative filter for that. But you can't do that here. You can't say, just because you've given to breast cancer, and most people who give to breast cancer are going to give to this charity, you're also going to do that because you look the same, you live in the same area, and you read the same newspapers. It just doesn't work that way. And so we were a bit stuck because for most retail organizations, this is fantastic. You could do that. So we needed a completely different level of personalization. And like I said, I sort of jumped ahead because of time. These traditional methods were just not working. And again, it just sort of re-emphasizes my point about the data science and the science element. So this is the ability to look at other forms, be curious, as you said. How else can we solve this problem about working out what the particular person cares about? So this is working with academics, like you guys, <laughs> <laughs> but people in a whole bunch of different fields. So trying to understand, we work with guys from Harvard, behavioral economists, Dan Ariely, you might have heard of some of his researchers, um, to try and work out how do people make the decision about things that they care about? And it was pretty interesting. There's lots of research in this space. I can't say all of it works because here's where big data really helps us. There's a big difference between an ex lab experiment mm. and reality, I think, um, in many of these instances. So testing over that sample when you don't really need small samples, you have bigger samples that you have access to gave us um, some really big clues. Anybody heard of this guy? Nick Christakis, he, he does a fantastic TED talk about relationships. One of our scientists stumbled upon some of his work and started spending a lot more time. We dug into a whole bunch of things around relationships. Really interesting. So here you can see how crime flows through relationships, how generosity flows through the relationships, how what we're passionate and what we care about through, flows through relationships. And relationships can be created in anything. In this room, all of us will ha are essentially nodes, and we have the connection by the fact that we're in this room. And that can say a lot about what we're interested in just by the fact that we're all here. So Nick Pristak has provided a huge amount of information. This, this was gold for us, so we dug into that a huge amount. It turns out the answer was also right in our face in terms of what do people care about. If you read the stories in more depth, the information was actually there. Those signals were there, but we didn't look at it in that way. Just look at that. You can see exactly why these guys have decided to do this particular event. And it's because of people we know. It's because of people we care about. We discover different causes based on who we know. So just even your colleagues, for example, and you have one colleague that suffers from some sort of ailment or knows someone that suffers from some sort of ailment, you learn about that. You may hear about a charity that you would have never heard of before just by virtue of meeting somebody. So connections becomes absolutely essential. And what's exciting is when you have these connections, you can run calculations over them. Calculations which were difficult to calculate before because we didn't have the computing power. So, um, you know, running things over graph theory, for example, some of the betweenness or closeness calculations, these are really hard. They're really iterative calculations that you have to go through every node and edge through, and it's quite difficult to do. Um, but now we're in a position with uh, the, the computing power that we have to be able to run some of these calculations. And the combination really excited us, the combination of Nick Christakis's work and this, and we were in a position to build our gift graph. Because we do have a network in our, in our system. When somebody decides to run the marathon, one of your friends, and they reach out to you and you come and support them, you've created, you're a node, they're a node, you've created a relationship between the two of them. A charity says they look after cats with one leg that need rehousing. Each of those become a node. We talked about ontologies earlier. I can't remember again who said that, but someone talked about ontologies and being able to manage them in the graph. Um, and that really got us to this position. 
Um, and so the scientists, now we're five scientists and we get to this position, we've now built the building algorithms that help us understand what people care about. The graph is pretty big, all right? So this number moves every day. 87 million nodes and more than 400 million relationships. Imagine a calculation you have to do once a new node comes into play or a new relationship, the whole thing changes. Every calculation has to be recalculated. Um, and so the difficult thing is, oh, by the way, this is basically, we got to a stage where we could rephrase our problem statement because we knew we could use machine learning to make things more engaging using behavioral economics and things like that. So I'll give you a real quick anecdote there. So you've seen how some websites say, five of your friends liked this, or five of your friends have done that, right? So that's a, a Bob Cialdini nudge, which essentially says that, you know, you, we like to conform, we don't want to risk social exclusion. But data plays a bigger part in that because we can pick the five that are most important to you. If there are certain five friends that like something that you don't really care about, you don't really feel socially excluded. But if it's the five that actually you need to stay within that and you risk major social exclusion, then you need to put them into play. You know? And so data changes the way some of those sort of things work. And so that's where machine learning helps. What if it was 10? So if, if you, is it better to have 10 and subselect the best five yeah. or just so here's the thing, it depends which country you're from. <laughs> so some countries are um, socially exclusive, inclusive. Um, Asia and Africa, for example, those continents really um, have the, that sort of behavior. And then the West is socially, it's um, uh, individualist, if you like. Everybody wants to be different like everyone in Shoreditch. Interestingly, they're all exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so you also have graph theory, which we could use for um, being more personal and being more social. Um, and finally, just as a result of doing that, we get to the position now that you can sell the whole idea of we need five more guys. But now we need engineers mm. because we need to make this real. Building a graph is not easy. Building this machine that we have to build, which is essentially now a machine or a robot effectively that could work out how you want to give. Do you want to give time? Do you want to run? Do you want to um, uh, you know, cycle? Do you want to give money? How much do you want to give? How much are you able to give? You know, because we have to remain ethical. Uh, what do you care about? What cause do you care about? And remember, what you care about changes as well. It's not static. So the moment something else happens into your, in your life, everything changes. I have children now. What I feel about children is completely... I've, I've always cared about children, so it sounds like I don't care about <laughs> But now that I have children, I'm even more passionate about that than I was before. You know, and those sort of things. So events happen. As soon as those events happen, it triggers something else. So that graph, in terms of the care graph, has to change. So it has to be dynamic. Um, and how do we serve content that's engaging to you? We talked about the different countries that you could be from. It's different for each individual. So being really, really personal. And this is the product. This is the product that we built in September last year and we sort of refined over the last few years. This is the, so the, the social giving platform that we managed to build, where people can come, find things that they care about, find things that they're passionate about, connect to other people, and uh, essentially start becoming a bit more generous. There are a lot of uh, small nudges that are taking place here. Um, but some really interesting things to basically get people to find the things that they are passionate about and what their friends are doing. Um, but like I said, building a real-time graph that does all of that, you couldn't get your five data scientists to do that. In fact, we tried. We tried with several graph databases and we just struggled. We couldn't productionize this. We needed the engineers, the guys who knew how to manipulate this large amount of data and put that into place. But I love what you said earlier when you talked about it being a spectrum. Because our engineers couldn't just be purely software engineers. That didn't work. We tried that. We needed engineers who spoke the language of the data scientists so that they had some form of commonality. Um, and that's really, really exciting because for the data scientists, it gave them a skill set that they never had before and they wanted to learn. For the data engineers, it gave them a skill set that they could also hone in. So it was re a really good symbiotic relationship, if you like. <laughs> um, and the platform that we used is one that I haven't heard much of today. It's actually Microsoft Azure. Does anyone here use that? Oh, great. Okay, but I didn't see it very much on the screen. So um, we love the platform as a service nature for it. Uh, what was great for us is that we didn't need to hire architects. We could literally just focus on doing what we needed to do. Um, this architecture is outdated, so I don't mind you taking a picture. Um, <laughs> it's been updated since then. But essentially, these are all the things that we need, the services that we needed to build. We needed to build a graph in a form of table storage, which you can imagine the permutations of how connections can be. Building a graph as a, as a tabular sort of approach, that's going to be difficult, and it's going to be huge, right, of all the permutations and combinations that you have to put together. 
Um, oh, sorry, some am animation by our marketing team. <laughs> you can tell the data scientists did do that. So, um, and I suppose that's, that's it. That's all I wanted to say, really. There's so much you can cover in terms of building a team. But the key mm -hmm. thing was staying lean, focusing on value. And we had to do that by taking sort of an iterative approach and every time delivering something that was really valuable. Most importantly, once the organization was a bit more mature enough and we didn't have to do sales, because there's a lot of non-believers in this world, by the way, you know, so within your organizations that you have to convince. And we get the organization to that point and we have a really clearly articulated problem statement. We were in a really good position to start building this. And then get some money as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so thank you guys. That's, uh, cool. So I, I think we have time, yeah, for a couple more questions. Actually, I've got one question. That image you showed of the graph, is that a real image? or is That's that a real image. It's so using Gephi. How come everything's so disconnected? Oh, OK. So that's a quite a high elevated view. It's mm. quite a dense graph, actually, if you go down into it. Right. It's just there's too many nodes to be able to even put yeah. through, through yeah. Gephi and make oh, it. It's an in-memory app, so there's no way we could, we could do that. Yeah. Uh, who has actually, can I ask oh, a question? Yeah. When, when you increase um, your, your data teams. You went from two to five to ten? Yeah. So, so when you... Uh, so it, it was like two, three, four, but then it's so actually... It was, was, oh, sorry. So then just five of it. So, and, uh, so yeah. it was actually quite linear. Yes, it was. So yeah. did but, you but we knew what we were looking for. So yeah. when we were at two, we knew we, we, we basically bought, um, got enough budget for five. Yeah. And so we had to recruit those three. Okay. But then we got budget for 10, yeah. so we had to recruit those five. Okay. That's okay. how it went. And when, when you tried to sort of get the buy-in or kind of justify the fact that you did need those, yeah. did, did, you, did you see that you could kind of see a linear extrapolation of, you know, if we can do this much with two, then this is how we could do with five? Or was it slightly non-linear? No, oh, it was, but it was really based on what we could deliver. Um, and so the, the value that we'd got to, we, we were in a really good position to say, with the resources that we have, this is what we've got. Imagine what we could do if we built this, but we don't have the skills for it or the resources for okay. it, so we need, okay. the, we need to yeah. recruit. So it was That's kind of a skills did. gap that you were trying to fill as well? A combination. Right? From yeah. the five to the 10 was a skills gap. Um, from the two to the five was uh, manpower. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So quick couple of quick questions. I think, yeah, they're, they're an essential part to that whole equation. So if you think about it as a marketplace where the charities are the shopkeepers, if you like, and we're bringing in, they're bringing in some of the people, but we're also helping stimulate that demand um, internally within that marketplace. So um, once we work out what people care about, there are a lot of people outside of the charity's ecosystem there. You know, so the charity might have brought you as a fundraiser. You wanted to run the marathon for them. Um, that's great. They brought you. You brought your friends. How many of your friends actually could have supported that charity too? And that's information that we can pull through the graph and, and potentially share with the charity. So we're working on the next evolution of some of the things that we could do with that. Would you consider selling the data that you've gathered uh, to give that money to charity? Um, that's not a model I've built <laughs> yet. So, um, <laughs> probably one that I, I, we can try and see, but potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I meant this. Yeah. This guy has an no. uh, Okay, so uh, I've got a question that actually is related to the workshop question, how to become an effective data scientist. Uh, if I don't have a PhD or, or if I actually don't probably have time to attend the ASC fellowship, um, I have this problem that if I come from a computer science background and if uh, I program something that is wrong, I have an exception and I know that something is wrong. But when I try to tackle some um, Kaggle problems or some things that um, I do for my job, 
I hit the ceiling and I basically don't know what I don't know, uh, how to improve. Okay, you want to have that? Do you mean as far as um, you, you don't know what, what model to use or you can only kind of get a specific kind of accuracy with whatever model you are, um, you are using? I think the specific, specific kind of accuracy or okay. uh, uh, insight yeah. that I didn't think of in the data set I have. So, that's that, so that, that part, unfortunately, is where it gets into the very um, ill-defined kind of um, section of data science, which is more um, of an art form which will specifically come from um, the domain-specific knowledge um, for that particular problem. So, I mean, a lot of the time in Kaggle competitions, they try and, um, uh, uh, like, anonymize the data or, or you aren't given what, what they are. But actually, in a real data science um, problem, a lot of the time, you'll get those key insights because you have that specific knowledge. And so, um, you, so you can go from the... Um, uh, the sort of um, elbow grease approach of throwing the kitchen sink at your problem, trying a host of different models with and keeping in the back of, back of your mind what it is you actually need. So, for example, um, if you want to if you want to get a ranking of something at the end of it, then you don't use um, something like k-means clustering, which will normally cluster into a, into a set number of um, uh, uh, of regions, but you want to use something else, maybe support vector machines, which will give a huge ranking um, that, that won't be degenerate. You've always got to think about that, that technical aspect, but then it's the art form of, of cleaning your data and representing it in a format that will be best um, for doing machine learning. So, for example, the reason that so many um, machine learning as a service or whatever they're calling themselves platforms are popping up is because the model building is easy. Like, that's the simple bit. You know, you can, you can, you know, if you're using Python, for example, you get the scikit-learn API and you, and you do a few, a few lines and that's it, you're done. The difficult bit is, is cleaning it and getting it and getting it into a, into a format that is ready um, to put into a machine learning model. Um, and then there's the whole problem of, so there was a, there was a recent um, paper by the team at Google talking about um, the machine learning debt um, that is sort of akin to the technical debt um, that we're more used to hearing in a software engineering environment. And it's because you have things like, um, uh, you, they, they, you have what they call glue code, which is you spend um, you know, thousands and thousands of lines actually getting your data into the format that's needed to do the machine learning model. And the, the model itself might as well just be a black box mm -hmm. and that you could pick, up, pick off from anywhere. But actually, the really difficult bit, which is more like the art form, is getting it into the right format. So. Like, unfortunately, there's no real easy way to say it. that that purely just comes from experience and having a bit of domain knowledge with your, um, with your field. So, for example, I mean, in my experience at Stylex, when I do my feature engineering and my, and my transformation of my data to get it um, into my recommender engine, I, I'm just like continually iterating and always thinking of different things that I can try to do and always iteratively, uh, iteratively improving. And, you know, this is, this is like continuous work that's been going on for, for months and months and months. So it's never, it's never like, a, oh, just you know, tweak this and your, your accuracy will increase by 10%. And if it does happen, then you're probably overfitting <laughs> and doing something really bad. So. I think we've got time for one more question. So this guy right at the back. No, sorry, <coughs> you've had one. <laughs> Hi. In one of your slides, you talk about uh, uh, data scientist quality assurance. Do you see this as a separate job profile or a, or a part of data science skill set? Because QA, quality assurance in itself is a big industry. And mm. I, I'm in quality assurance, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm curious to know about what skill sets or a QA needs to have to work in data science or data engineering. Yeah, let, me, let me just also add to that so hopefully these guys can answer that because I think that's a, that's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. It's one that we've struggled with. Mm -hmm. uh, traditional QA hasn't hasn't cut the mustard for us, basically. It hasn't, it hasn't worked. Um, so it'll be actually interesting to see if any of you guys have any thoughts on that. We're still working on it. I don't have an answer for that, actually. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll reflect that. Yeah, we are, we are still working on that, I think. But you, you raise a very interesting point that 
QAs, QAs are just like a standard part of a, of a software engineering house. Like that's, that's, that's the, you know, they, they, are, they are crucial um, to your product not being absolutely disastrous. And this isn't in place um, within, within kind of the data science team um, of a company with, with, for a lot of people. And, um, and I think the difficulty is, is that you, know, you spend your time and actually, um, like, like the previous question, you're more interested in just you know, improving the quality of your model and then shipping something and actually you haven't really thought about the production worthy quality of it. And so I think, I guess it's, it's got to be a combination of, so for example, um, and actually going back to the same, the same uh, paper by the, the Google team about m the machine learning debt, it's, it's really difficult to, to do unit testing for machine learning because um, you will always be um, you know, changing your model, changing your data sets. A lot of the time you'll be running it on, on data that's live and then you know, to try and put that into some local data store when you want to run a unit test and if it can take so, you know, however long it takes to fit your models, the, the standard way of doing unit testing can't just be transformed to the modules you've got for, for, um, for, your, machine, uh, for your data science. So, um, so I think it's, it's, it's basically a, a, a kind of a difficult problem, but it is, it is crucial. And I think it's, it's a case of a data scientist being here and a QA being here and maybe that, that communication between them and getting a bit, a bit closer so that both, of, both camps of people um, understand uh, that it, it's crucial um, as to what they're both doing. Um, and unit testing in a, in a data science um, world would be, would be the answer to that, I think. Mm -hmm. I think we might have to finish right there. Yeah. Yeah.